All right. Looks like we are live. Um, I know it's a delay between the actual YouTube channel. All right. So I'm going to say uh, ETM Hotep, and that's uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to our Divine Words Wednesday. And you're hanging out with the Seshu Ma'ani Meadow Nature. And uh, we have two shows a week or two hangouts a week. Uh, one is Divine Words Wednesday, which is tonight. And then on Fridays, we have our Freestyle Fridays. And our Freestyle Fridays are, um, you know, a fun exercise to test our uh, memory on identification of different uh, Sesh Meadow Nature signs or hieroglyphic signs and the meanings of different words and things like that. So, you know, it's a fun exercise just for us to sharpen our swords. But on Wednesday, we try to touch on uh, more specific um, information and share and, you know, do a brief expose of, of different issues. So tonight, we're going to do something a little different also. Um, we had a couple of requests to do or to discuss and to talk about. So tonight, we're going to discuss uh, two issues, um, not too long, not too extensive, but we're going to touch on uh, two different things. One is the meaning of Kemet. You know, a lot of people uh, have a little different differing opinions about what the word Kemet means. So we're going to discuss that, and then we're also going to discuss uh, adjectives inside of Rodney Kemet, which is the language. So we're going to discuss those two things. Can anyone see my screen? To you. All right. Uh, and check, make sure that it's seen on the YouTube channel too, because last time we were, I was talking and, and it wasn't showing. Yeah, um, it's good. All right. So um, again, you know, ETM Hotep, and welcome. And again, you're hanging out with the Seshu Mani Meadow Nature. But before we get started, um, what we've done, we've adopted something that Dr. Riketi Amin uh, does in in the beginning of any gatherings that she has, and I, I feel this is a very good idea, and so um, I suggest that we adopt it, and, and this is something that we have adopted. And what that is, is we would just recite um, a brief offering formula, and it's an offering formula to, um, to the deceased or ancestors. All right, and you know, usually in any kind of um, event that's African-centered, um, you'll see people perform a libation ritual where they pour libations for the ancestors before you know an event or some kind of celebration will begin. So since we're on social media and you know the internet, uh, we can't do that. But uh, instead, we will uh, recite an offering formula. All right. So what you see on the screen here at the top is the Sesh Meadow Nature, which is a hieroglyphics uh, hieroglyphic uh, script. And then below that you'll see a diacritic version of a transliteration. And then below that you have the translation. All right. So um, I'll just pronounce these. Now, the pronunciations, as we always say, um, that people use to pronounce these words are, very, are just tentative. They're conventional ways that we all pronounce the words. Um, and as you know, inside the script, the Sesh Metanetra script, there are no documentation of vowels. So even in the transliterations, when you when you happen to see a vowel here, for example, the I on the word D and um, the A, this will be a, a capital A in the manual decoders, or lowercase a, these are actually not vowels. They're uh, consonants. But for pronunciation purposes and to be able to talk about the language and, and you know, discuss it and, and study it, our early Egyptologists have come up with a, a, just a conventional way to pronounce the words. And it's generally sticking an E, the E vowel in between the different consonants. So this particular word would be neb and not noob, nib. They would just uh, use a standard convention among themselves. So this is what um, you'll hear. So I'll just pronounce it. It is Hotep di Nasu, Wasir Neb Jedu, Nature A Neb Abju. The F, Peret Cheru, Ti Henket, Ha Aped, Shes Menket. Ket, Nebet Neferet, Wabet, Anket, Nature Im, Inka In, Imaku, and then you see question marks. 
Now these question marks you would fill in and you would say someone's name and then after the name you would also say Makeru. So you would repeat this for any of your relatives or um, venerated ancestors that you wish to uh, give a voice offering. So let me read the the um, translation just so you know uh, what we're saying. So it's an offering which the king gives uh, to Osiris, Lord of Jedu, great God, Lord of Abydos, so that he may make verbal offerings in bread, beer, ox, fowl, alabaster, linen, every good and pure thing, everything good and pure on which a God lives, for the Ka of the revered one, and then you fill in the name, blank, and then after the you would say true of voice or vindicated, which would be what would uh, makeru mean. All right, so this is to um, make an invocation or verbal offering in the form of these items, and you have bread, which is tea, beer, um, ox, fowl, alabaster, and then linen here. And today it would, you know, layman's it would be meat. Bird, you know, we would bird, you know, people would say chicken, uh, steak, chicken, alabaster, and clothing. You know, that would be more up to date uh, things or what would pop up in our minds. All right. So that's so. You know, I encourage everyone to memorize this, use it, try to pronounce it. Now, mind you, that these pronunciation are are just simply conventional. They're not meant to be taken as his historically accurate pronunciations, all right? And we always uh, let people know that. But memorize it. Memorize it. Memorize how it looks in the session meta you see up here. And each, each of these lines is what you'll see here. So this top line is Hotep Di Nasu, Wasir, Neb Jadu, Netra Ah, Neb Abju, and then so on. Um, and pronounce it, you know, with, the, with what we call Egyptology speak or uh, what some others may call classroom pronunciations. All right, and then memorize, you know, what you're saying, and then use it. Use it at the appropriate times around the appropriate uh, people, uh, you know, let people uh, know about it. All right, so with that being said, um, again, my name is uh, Wu Jiao, and I'm sure I can't see, but I'm sure we have uh, other brothers and sisters of the Session Mighty Metanature in the hangout so um, if you all can unmute yourselves and just introduce yourself and let everyone know who's in the house. E T M O Chap, this is Damo. Uh, go by Damien Everly on Facebook, aka E one B one A eight. Just saying hotel and welcome to everybody. Peace. What's that? What's that? That's a uh, haplo group, right? <laughs> yeah, that's my potential. Group, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I hear that. I hear that. <laughs> All right. Maybe maybe after after we go over this, you can you can uh if you if you don't mind, you could break that down. You know. All right. Yeah. Uh, who else do we have? ETM Hotel. This is the brother June, also known as Robert Allen. Just want to say welcome and peace, everybody. Hope you enjoy the show. Hotel. ATM Hotel. Do I do I ooh? Echo no end. I'm in the raw. But I quite e second. Um I go by the name Kofi Pasa. And me and the group just would like to welcome, welcome, welcome you all to the show. Appreciate you. Hotel. Um this is um Tonika and um yeah, welcome to Divine Words Wednesdays and yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and nobody should actually go after Kofi. It's not fair. <laughs> yeah, Kofi should end end off the end all the roll call. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anybody else? If I can't see who we have. Nah, they'll this probably come in later. All right. Yeah, and this is not too too good because you know from my uh, vantage point, I'm just staring at a screen. You know, I I don't see anything, so it's kind of takes out the interaction for me. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Okay, so um, now, you know, uh, be mindful of the chat if anybody had any questions or anything. 
So I just have a few uh, slides. So these are the two things that we're going to discuss tonight. And the question, and these are basically based on requests. These are things that people have asked me or asked um, members of the SESHU. And, um, or, you know, these issues come up a lot. All right, so the first one is, does the word Kemet, does Kemet mean the land of the blacks? All right, and the second um, issue is our, our Rani Kemet, which is the spoken language, um, most people will say Egyptian. Uh, our Rani Kemet adjectives treated the same as adjectives in Spanish. All right, so those are the two things. So we'll deal with the first one. Now on the on the first topic, um, does Kemet mean the land of blacks? Okay, so so the question is where where does that question come from? And I've seen people ask, people have asked me this for, you know, every now and then over a period of time. Well, first of all, a lot of people know that Egypt was not called Egypt. You know, we get the word Egypt from, uh, by way of the Greek and Latin, uh, Egyptos, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But a lot of us know that. So we uh, do away with that, Egypt, and we refer to it as Kemet. But then the meaning... Um, th that's where you get differing of opinions about what Kemet means. Does it mean the land of blacks? Does it mean black land? Or does it mean um, black soil or fertility? Uh, the, the land of blacks is usually coming from uh, this particular uh, source, which is the, the African origins or the African origin of civilization, myth, or reality by Dr. Shek Anta Diop. All right. And there's a quote here from page seven. And it says, In fact, we know that the Egyptians called their country Kemet, which means black in their language. The interpretation according to which Kemet designates the black soil of Egypt rather than the black man and by extension the black race of the country of the blacks stems from the gratuitous distortion by minds aware of what an exact interpretation of this word would imply. Okay, so now this is something that we have to understand because Sheikh Antajiyab is saying that it's a distortion to um, think of that word to mean something dealing with the black soil of Egypt and that and not the black man or describing the black man or the country of black people okay so we have to understand the environment or the climate in which Sheikh Anta Diop is uh, making these statements uh, this book this particular version of his book is published in 1974 but it's this is the English version from his original French version which was published uh, prior to 1974 but in the climate, in the we have, we have to remember, before the 1974 uh, UNESCO conference, prior to that, there was a consistent push by academia worldwide. Um, there was a consistent push to separate Egypt from Africa. Even though we can look at a map of the country of Egypt uh, today, and even you know its borders from ancient times that they would draw there was an effort to separate that from Africa to to act as though Egypt was not part of Africa so you have that going on and this was going on for decades decades uh, of that or that being implied and then on top of that the people of Egypt because Egypt was so spectacular um, the people of Egypt the ancient Egyptians were uh, looked at as being non-African, okay. Either either the Egyptians were said to have, to have come from Western Asia, or even Europe. Okay, so this this is the prevailing uh, mentality prior to the 1970s in in all of academia and in Egyptology. People who study um, Egypt, and mixed in with that, obviously you have the racial uh, polarization, the racial climate where you had um, the slave holocaust and because Egypt was such a, a spectacular civilization and, and 
provided and contributed contributed so much to the world, civilizations around the world, that there was no way that society or even poli politically that you can justify the enslavement or this slave holocaust of a people, the same people who are responsible for that very civilization that's being studied at the time, during, you know, in Egyptology and so on and so forth. So there is there was a a purposeful disconnect from Egypt from being in Africa and from Egypt being uh, developed and given birth by African people. So with that said, in that environment, in that climate, in that academic climate, political climate, social climate, this is where Sheikh Anta Giyab, along with uh, Dr. Theophilo Binga, uh, this is what they had to contend with. Okay, so this is why in a lot of their writings, uh, for example, even with the linguistic work that they've done for the arrangements of the African language families, um, Dr. Dia, um, excuse me, uh, Dr. Theophilo Benga chose to use a, a title of Negro Egyptian for, for the language phylum that would house or contain the related African languages, and Negro in French because uh, both Sheikh Anta Giyab and Dr. Theophilo Benga they wrote their works in French, and in French Negro just like Spanish Negro means black. It's the color black. It's not. It doesn't have a um, derogatory sense, uh, as you know we may know over here. Um, so the push, even even in the naming of a language family as Negro Egyptian, was basically a push back for the prevailing uh, thought at the time that Egypt was either Asian or, in terms of of if you want to put a color on it, was white. So everybody was white Egypt, white Egypt, Egypt is not in Africa, uh, the Egyptians are either from Europe or West Asia, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the pushback that Sheikh Anta Giyab and Dr. Theophile Obinga were uh, dealing with. So they pushed back. So they said, nope, black Egypt, you know, black Egypt and black um, Negro Egyptian, so black Egyptian uh, language, and then Egypt is black, all right? So I just wanted to kind of give give that climate on some of the um, you know environment that these writings are um, developed in. All right. So from that and from this particular book and even some other um, books and videos, people have repeated the meaning of Kemet to to be uh, the country of blacks or the land of the blacks. All right. So it's it's kind of just been repeated, repeated and repeated. All right. So now let's let's dig a little deeper into um, the word Kemet. All right. So first of all, we have to realize that Kemet is the name of a place. Okay. And this brings us to uh, what's called toponyms. And the definition is on the screen as a noun. Toponyms is a noun, and it's the, simply the name of a place or two any name derived from a place name. So these are simply pl place names. All right? And the etymology of the word is uh, comes from the Greek topos, which means place, and onym, which means name. Simple enough. It's a place name. All right? And uh, toponymy is the study of place names. All right? And it's from 1876. Its usage, usage is from 1876. So that's simple enough. So this is what we're dealing with. So when we say things like Kemet and we say uh, Ta-Nehisi, when we start naming places, we're dealing with toponyms. All right. Now, so what um, what comprises a toponym? How how are toponyms selected by the people? You know, um, you know how do how do the people name their different locations, their villages, their cities, their uh, wherever they dwell, you know what what go what all goes into a place name, all right. So for that, we're looking at a, an African um, journal, a journal called the African Journal of History and Culture. Now this picture on the screen is from um, the July edition, volume eight, number two. Uh, the picture itself is from there, but this uh, these quotations here is from volume number seven. 
All right, uh, it's in the archive. But this picture here is just for the purposes of those who are watching. Uh, you can get the name of the journal and the website itself. All right, but it's volume seven um, that these quotes are coming out of. All right, so I'll just read. It says toponyms fulfill the task of identifying localities, thereby distinguishing them from one another. More so, they serve as cartographic labels that can be used for orientation, navigation, recreation, and reference points. A place name imparts a certain character on a place. Thus, place names can also provide a glimpse of the lifestyle led by the people. For instance, Geographical names can suggest that a people were settlers rather than ferocious raiders. In other words, place names could be used to judge the way of life associated with a people, whether it is sedentary or nomadic. One potent means by which they effectively encoded and, and communicated cartographic and geographic information was by the use of toponyms, names of places and other geographical features. Thus, in vintage African societies, place names were not just chosen arbitrarily. They were carefully chosen to convey specific and useful meanings to the people. All right, and that's important because a lot of times with the cultures in the West, you know, here in the United States, a lot of naming is done arbitrarily, you know, um, or I should say more arbitrarily than in Africa. In Africa, names mean a whole lot. You know, names are taken very, very seriously in some uh, communities. Matter of fact, if you if you don't have a name or identity, because a name equals identity, and if you don't have a name, then you, therefore you have, don't have an identity, therefore you don't exist. That's um, in some communities, it's taken that serious. Okay, to so go on. This is from the same volume. Indigenous African place names have an enormous treasure of geographical information and knowledge inherent in them. In a typical traditional African society, place names are used to succinctly describe geographical phenomena. Roden's account of the use of place names to identify various geographical conditions and features in Uganda typifies what is obtainable in a cla classic African society. As observed by Roden, and this Rodin is an author of a particular um, piece. It's dated from 1974, and it's page 82 uh, from there. And it's actually quoted within the, the uh, journal itself. And he states, a very prominent group of Ugandan place names are those which describe, describe or imply the physical characteristics of an area. Relief, climate, soils, hydrology, hydrology Flora and fauna all feature in names throughout the country. Often the description is in terms of the suitability of an area for human activity, the fertility of the soil, the presence of water, reliability of rainfall, suitability for a particular crop, a river or swamp which engenders life, the occurrence of a tree or grass species of value for house building, tool making and handcrafts, and the presence of clay for pottery are all frequent examples. Other names suggest the type of land use describing a prominent crop or the presence of grazing uh, land and so on. So this is very important to keep in mind. All right. So this is very customary of Africans across the continent but specifically uh, in this example he's dealing with Uganda and Ugandan. All right. So remember that in these place names uh, there's, as it says, there's an enormous treasure of geographical information and knowledge inherent in them, and this is the kind of information that that they provide. They speak about these names will incorporate uh, descriptions of the climate, soil, hyd hydrology, uh, um, the the flora, fauna, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so keep that in mind. Now we're going to move to. Kemet itself in the language in the language itself. All right. So in Kemet, uh, toponyms or place names um, have these usual determinatives. And for those who um, need to know, determinatives are glyphs or signs that help determine. And then that's where we get why we get the name determinative. They help determine the meaning of 
a word. All right. And so, and they usually come at the end of a word. So if you see a set of glyphs, uh, these determinatives will usually be the last glyph in a particular word. Okay, so these particular glyphs, and there's a, a few more, but these are just for example purposes. Uh, these particular glyphs are usually used for um, toponyms. So you see this at, at the end of place names. So like the first one, and what you see here are the, are the glyphs in the left column. The center column is the code. Now these codes are um, from Gardner sign list. Okay, and whenever you hear Gardner uh, sign list, it's speaking about a man named Alan H. Gardner, who uh, basically codified the signs into groups, into categories, and he labeled these categories A through Z, skipping J. He skipped the letter J. A through Z, and then he has a another category, double A. All right, and what he did was he grouped these, you know, hundreds of glyphs according to a common theme. So, for example, all of the glyphs that deal with vegetation would be in the category of M, as in Mary. All of the glyphs dealing with human body parts would be in D, as in dog, um, you know, and so on. Uh, all of the birds, for example, would be in G. Okay, so these codes would designate the category uh, letter and then the sequential number. So when you see N36, it would be in the category of N, and N deals with um, water, earth, the sky, and so on and so forth, environment, nature, um, and then the sequential number. So N36 would show you this particular glyph, and the descriptions are here on the right-hand side. So this first one is a canal. This is a pool of water. This is uh, representative of a road. This is represented as a piece of land or tongue of land. This represents an irrigation channel or ca canal. This represents a mountainous area or hilly area. This represents a town, village, or an inhabitable uh, place, place that's populated. And this represents water. All right. So those th these are the individual glyphs, just to show you how um, words are determined uh, with the last glyph. So now we're going to look at actual words themselves. So here are some Nekemet toponyms. Now, the word Nekemet that you see here, uh, instead of saying Egyptian, we say Nekemet. All right, so we keep the word Kemet and we put the appropriate um, pre uh, word the appropriate words together, ni would be of or belonging to Kemet. So like when we say Egyptian, if I say Egyptian book or Egyptian uh, singer, I'm saying a person who belongs to Egypt. Um, so this is the same way to keep it indigenous. So we say ni Kemet instead of Egyptian. All right. And so here's some actual uh, place names or actual toponyms. Okay. So the first one you see here is happy. And this is the um, transliteration in the center. And here's the description. So the happy is what we would call the Nile River today. Most people call it the Nilo, so a Nile River uh, today. Then we have um, Mehet or Mehut would be the Delta Marshes. That will be the area of Egypt today that's close to the Mediterranean um, that fans out that you always see on the maps. Then we have uh, Jedut, which is a, a, a city. It's called Mendez, or what was called Mendez, um, the Greek uh, rendition of that city. We have uh, Baset, which is Bubab, Bubastis today, or you, you know, this is how you would find it today, um, or being referred to today. Now, a lot of these cities ha also have Arabic names because, as, as you know, Egypt today is um, the language of Egypt today is uh, Arabic. All right, and a lot of place names have Arabic names, but these are still searchable. You can find uh, all these names. Next one is uh, Dep. Next one is Jedu, and actually this place, this one was uh, inside the uh, Hotel Dinasut that we said earlier. This is uh, Busiris. Next one is um, Iunu. Most people may say On or Anu, and it's uh, referring to Heliopolis. Then you have Minnefer. This is a famous one. People know as Memphis. Then we have uh, Chemnu, 
which is another famous one that people uh, know as Hermopolis. And then we have um, Abju, which is Abydos. A lot of people are familiar with uh, Abydos or Abydos. And then we have um, Abu. Now there's plenty, there's a lot, a lot more um, place names. So these are just selected for example purposes. All right. So the last one is Abu, which is Elephantine uh, today. Most people know it's Elephantine. All right. Now notice that uh, all of these have this uh, last determinative here. So this is what I mean by determinatives. It's the last sign inside of these words. Can you all see my cursor? To you. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, um, and then you see the water as the determinatives. All right. So remember that this particular determinative deals with a populated area, town, city, or village. All right. And you know it's nicknamed the X Men bu uh, belt buckle because it looks like it looks just like the uh, X Men sign. Now, uh, this particular book written by Asar Motep is called Nisubiti uh, King in Ancient Egyptian Lesson in Paranimi and Leadership. There's a quote out of, out of here, um, and I suggest that people uh, definitely purchase the book. The book is, is, um, is outstanding in, in the information on the subject and even more, you know, um, on the subject of Nisubiti and a whole lot more dealing with a uh, linguistic breakdown of the Nisubiti and a lot of other words and information. But this particular quote um, from page uh, 104, 105 in the book, um, it says, I noted in Imhotep, this is a previous publication by Asar Imhotep, 2014, that the word Kemet, and this is a typo, excuse the typo. I got my book out because uh... Okay, turn to that for me. That's a typo. And I apologize for uh, for, the, for the viewers. Um, hold on, let me see. Okay, okay, I see where you got 2004. That the word Kemet. Okay, and that's supposed to be also also applied. Okay, there you go. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. So um, I note in Imhotep 2014 that the word Kemet also applied to specific cities within ancient Egypt. It is no coincidence that all of these names are places located in Lower Egypt. And then these are the pages. So I, you know. Um, I definitely encourage people to, to get that book for all of the wealth of information that's in there. But this is this is um, important um, as well, and this is why I pull this point this out, is because there are cities within the country that we know as ancient Kemet that were called themselves Kemet, and and the place names that are given. For example, um, we have a place name uh, Kemwer which is a canal in the gnome of Thebes. Then you have um, Kimwer, another one, Kimwer, that, that, is bitter, that means bitter lakes, and it's a region of lakes inside the delta. Then you have Ta Kemet, which is a, t a town in the eastern delta. Then you have Kim Ka, which is a necropolis of Saqqara. And then you have Kim Sat, which is a district situated um, where the situation is, uh, where it's situated is unknown, and that's out of um, Budget's dictionary. So there, there's there's a, a quite a few examples of these cities or place names that have the word Kemet in there. But as the quote says, there's no coincidence that these cities and things were in the Delta, and there's a there's a, a reason for that. So we're gonna get to that because people uh, because people are aware that the word Kim means black. You know, I think a lot of people have that understanding that it means black as an adjective to describe something. So if I want to say a black hair, black book, black um, uh, desk, black tire, you would you would say Kim. The word Kim would be appropriate. And this is how it looks in its adjective form. As an adjective, the word Kim, meaning black, has this hair determinative. This is a, um, a part of hair. It's supposed to be hair. And this is how it is, is um, used, and this is determinative for that, chem meaning the, the color black. And then we have the color red, which is desher, which is red, and you see it's determined by a, a bird that's actually red. The bird itself is red. The actual living um, natural bird is red itself. So this is why it's used um, as a determinative to indicate that particular color. 
Okay, so we have the word desher for red as an adjective and the word kim for black. So it's it's because of these adjectives or because of this particular adjective, kim, that we tend to want to say kemet means the land of blacks to describe the skin color of people or so on and so forth. All right, so this is why. But as you can see, it doesn't have the city determinative. Let me go back. Um, all of these have city determinatives. Now I'm gonna come back to this uh, this slide. I'm gonna move forward first. So now, these are the adjectives. So this is the adjective form of these two words. So we have black, the color black, and the color red. So now let's deal with the actual toponym. So now we're dealing with toponyms again, place names. So here we see Kemet, and a lot of people should be uh, familiar with the, how this looks visually because it's you know we see it all the time. We see the um, one, two, three, four signs here, four signs here. Both of these are Kemet. These are, this is a variation of each other. This one is, as I said, that city determinative. This one is a water channel. And this is versus Desheret, which is uh, determined by both the bird here and the hills. And we also have a variation of it with the city determinative. Okay. Now, as I said, Kim is black, Desher is red. So what people are interpreting at, uh, as Kemet as is the word Kim, the word black in there is describing the people. So we're saying black people. And following that logic, if we go over here to Desheret, then we would have to say, in order to follow that same logic, we would have to say that this is talking about red people or people whose skin is red. And that's just simply not true. All right. Now, let me go back to this slide here. If, I, if we were to follow that exact same logic that Kemet, because the adjective Kim means black, and when it's talking about a city, it's talking about the skin color of the people being black people, black skin. And like I said, Desheret, that would, that would also mean, following the same logic, that Desheret would be red people and not talking about the, the city or the location, the population. Now, if that were all true and we would follow that same logic, then let's take a look at this last one here. Abu. The word Abu is the word for elephant, but it's also the name of a location known today as Elephantine. So with that logic, that means that these people are elephants or they look like elephants or, you know, they're being described as elephants with that same logic. And that's just simply not true. Or let's take, let's go up here to Kemnu. The word Kemnu means eight the number eight and it's the city of eight okay now if we were to follow that same logic to follow it literally then that means that it's describing people who are eights or or something they're dealing with eight and that's simply not true and let's go up to this this one here which is uh, Heliopolis this is a um, a pillar okay the word Iun is the word for pillar as something standing tall. That's why you see it here, a pillar. So it's the city of the pillar. But if if we were to use that same logic, then we would say that the people are pillars or look like pillars. And that's just simply not true. And I, I can do this for all of the cities, even the ones that I don't have uh, listed here. So basically, I, I, I'm doing this to show you that the logic breaks down when we when we move over to every other city okay so the logic is inconsistent alright so even though the word Kim means black as an adjective and the word Desheret means red as an adjective alright so now <clears throat> so w what does this mean uh, though so if it's not talking about the color of the skin skin color then what does it mean so what we're dealing with is that the the color black here the adjective black and adjective red they're not used literally to be speaking about the skin color of the people the word black in the word kim or kemet and the word for red desher 
in the word desharet is speaking about fer fertility versus infertility because desharet is where the desert is these are desert regions within the country and these are fertile re regions within the country so Kemet is identifying is a toponym and I'm going to go back to our journal remember toponyms give uh, descriptions of relief, climate, soils, hydrology, uh, flora, fauna, etc., etc. So, what indigenous Africans of the Nile Valley did, they chose a toponym that describes their environment, that describes, um, um, you know, something dealing with the climate, the environment, and things like that. So, so they're using the word black to describe the fertility of these particular areas versus the infertile areas that they're calling desharet over here desharet so what we're looking at is uh, the difference between fertile and infertile black and red black being fertile red being infertile alright it's not talking about the color of the people's skin in either case so, for those people who will translate Kemet as black land, now we have to just be mindful that it's okay to say that, but there has to be an understanding that the word black in that phrase, uh, black land, doesn't mean literally the skin color of any people. It's used metaphorically for the idea of fertility, okay, via water. And this is why... Um, I said I, I said that it's that it's important to be mindful of even particular cities in the nation of Kemet also being called Kemet and those particular cities that were also called Kemet were in the Delta region because in the Delta region is where a lot of the water was. It was more of the swampy areas, the more of the um, areas that had an abundance of water. The further south you go on our maps, which would be going upstream in Kemet the the less water that you would see the less wide um, coverage of water I should say as far as geographical territory there therefore they had to build uh, channels and irrigation uh, channels and canals uh, to, to let the water flow more um, broadly instead of rely strictly strictly on the Nile River itself so the further south you go on our maps or further upstream you go the narrow the river would be all right, so just keep all of that in mind. So again, it's okay to say Kemet means black land, even though the word land is not in the word because we know the word ta means land. But the word Kemet is referring to the fertile areas that um, would be sustainable for a large population of people or for a community of people so that's therefore you see these uh, town or city determinatives on these particular words meaning that there's a, a population of people that will live there alright and there are also other cities city names or toponyms within the nation of Kemet that had the hill determinative because these were located either in um, infertile areas or literally near the hills or in the desert areas alright so I'll just stop there with with that subject you know I just wanted to uh, cover that before we go on to the next one which would be adjective so uh, is anybody on the panel like I said I can't see uh, see you all right now but um, anybody want to uh, comment or um, chime in on that before we go on yeah if I can <laughs> hello can you hear me yeah to you I can hear you alright We'll do uh, for that. That was nice. Um, I hope people, uh, you know, are following along and uh, picking it up. Um, so I wanted, to, I wanted to try and uh, read some from this book that talks about the the same thing. Um, and actually, the slide that you had up there with the um, Desheret and Kemet. Um, it, it, it kind of talks to that slide. This this book is uh, Understanding Hieroglyphs by uh, Wilson. But it's, it was talking about uh, Kemet, the black land, a, a name derived from the rich alluvial soil of the Nile Valley. 
In keeping with the idea of equilibrium, the black land was b balanced by the red land, the desert. The Egyptian word for desert included, includes the flamenco, that's as we've seen on the slide, um, the flamenco hieroglyph, which signifies the color red. It is not impossible that the word deserta entered the Latin language by the way of the Egyptian. Uh, it is easy to imagine a Roman traveler asking the name of the sandy waste to the east and west of the Fertile Valley only to be told Desheret. So it's just, um, that tripped me out because even the word uh, Desheret that might have uh, survived on into our language as uh, desert, um, you know, was signifying the the actual land and not the the color of the people living there. So um, those are good points that you made. I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it. I know I did. I uh, appreciate that. Also, um, as a suggestion as well uh, for people to look into, I don't have it on the slide, but I would suggest people read the story of Senuhe. Um, and in that story, you'll see a lot of the use of the word Kemet in, in that particular story. Also, you'll find the word Tamare or Tameri uh, within, within there. Um, and you'll see that these words are used in uh, opposition of one, one another, where you have the red and the black, the, uh, the, the term for Kemet, meaning the fertile area, and then the word for Desheret for uh, the infertile area. Um, and then you have um, some other texts that will actually use these words in opposition or contradistinction between each other. All right. So you have textual clues that the word Kemet was never used for to describe the skin color of the people. And you have to also think that logically, as I, as I pointed out, that if that were true, then then a place like um, Abu would be describing, you know, the elephant is not describing the people. Actually, uh, if the brother Antoine was here, I know he shared some pictures with us from his trip. Within that area of Abu, the actual rocks in that area look like elephants. And, and it's from that that it's um, highly likely that that's how it got its name. So, so these place names are given as the journal as recorded from the uh, journal, is uh, based on, you know, geographic uh, conditions, the uh, climate, uh, spoke to whether the area was suitable for farming or suitable for grazing and things like that, all right? So, and we have to also remember that, that in Kemet, duality prevailed. So we have this dual, dual uh, phenomena going on. So we have red versus black. So Kemet versus Desheret. Fertile versus infertile. We have Ta Mary versus Ta Seti. Ta Mary being the land of the whole, meaning meaning that the conditions were good for farming, and then Ta Seti, which is the land of the bow, which is are which are areas that are conducive for hunting, people that were good with the bow. Okay, so we have that kind of uh, thing going on. Then you have um, um, Ta Shemau which is the narrow area of the country, and then Ta Mehu, which is the end of the country. So you have these, these opposing words that are used all throughout the different texts. So there's no difference between Kemet and Desheret, black versus red, fertile versus infertile. And then they also have to look that in Africa, Africa is diverse. It has the most diversity um, in phenotypes, in genetics, and so on, and languages uh, in the entire world. You know, so people have different skin tones in Africa, and it would have been no different in Kemet. Every no, you know, all the people wasn't weren't monotone, all the same. You know, so we have to we have to keep all of these things um, in mind, and then be mindful that that our elder scholars, who are ancestors now, uh, out the Giap, especially, you know, the climate in which these things were being said. Um, in terms of uh, the land of the blacks because Africa uh, they also say black Africa now that would seem redundant to say black Africa because in our minds you say Africa you know you automatically think black but in an in a academic climate where people were constantly constantly pushing that Egypt was was either white 
as a color, you know, in terms of color, uh, identifying races with color, or European or Western Asian, Asia. So the pushback, the pushback was that no, Africa is black, so we can call it black Africa. Egypt was black, so we can call it black Egypt. Uh, the word Kemet means the land of the blacks. Not the land of the whites, not the land of the Asians, but the land of the blacks. So, so we just had to keep this in mind. So, you know, with that in mind, we can continue to um, to use it and and hold our um, elders' words up high. You know, as long as we have that understanding. Well, now I, I can actually see um, the chat. Were there any any comments, questions from the chat that I missed? Um, so, someone, someone had, had uh, like, like the, the meaning of um, the new sign. Yeah, it, it it means a populated area. Um, there's a there's a semantic uh, you know kind of field with that, but it means a town, a community, a city, a village, and it all boils down to an area that is sustainable for people to live. And yeah, that was the brother uh, Strife 777. Okay, yeah, no problem. So, and it's used, it's used for more of a, a populated area as opposed to the hills, which were also populated, but um, the difference is that hills were, the hilly areas were either infertile for um, you know, more permanency or in terms of farming and things like that. They, they, you know, hilly, hilly cities or hilly areas that have that hill determinative, uh, you'll find those cities being used for um, rock quarry, quarries. Um, you'll find it being used for gold um, areas, mining, and different things like that. Um, out, outposts for uh, cities that became forts along the borders. And we have to remember that borders, like, you know, today we have, board, you know, these imaginary borders. But in Africa, especially in the Nile Valley, Kemet um, had natural borders. So the desert on the, on the east and west of the Nile served as a natural border. And then, and then so you have the, the, the river itself. And, and, and matter of fact, um, maybe if somebody could find just the common map that we see of, of uh, the Nile Valley. Usually on the maps on the Nile Valley, you'll you'll see the river, you'll see the Nile River, but then right on the edge of the Nile River, on the on both left and right hand side of the Nile River, you'll see green, and then on the other side of the green, on both sides, you'll see brown, and then you'll see the hills. So you have the river itself, then you have the fertile area that's close to the river, and then beyond that you have the desert, and then beyond that you have the hills. So these things served as natural uh, borders for the country you know so the, it, you know it wasn't like imaginary borders and then so the northern border north on our maps would be the Mediterranean Sea itself that they called the Great Green um, Wedge were, which is the Great Green that was the Mediterranean and then to the south on our maps which would be upstream to to the ancient uh, Remich or ancient Egyptians uh, the border would have been the first cataract near today where the Aswan Dam is and so on in that in that uh, general area so you have these natural borders then on the east and west you had the you had the uh, Red Sea of course um, but even before you get to the Red Sea you had the desert and hills and then on the other side you have the desert and hills so these were natural borders was there any other anything else I'm scrolling up I'm trying to see if there was any questions uh, I think that was the only question. Um, well, I see uh, Stripe had posted uh, the one about, uh, <clears throat> what was that about, uh, with Sir? Uh, he said, I'm probably jumping the gun as with Sir shown as Kim. Kim? Mm, K -M. Yeah. Kim, where? You, got, you know, they, they say Kim that uh, Will Sear is the great black. So I, I mean I don't seen I don't heard that before, but I haven't seen it in no primary where it um uh it's uh I seen the primary it said Wu Sir is Kim Where. 
but I done read that in a couple a few books that you know who series called the Great Black. Well, they say you know people say Lord of the Perfect Black. That's what that's what a lot a lot of people will say. But again, we have to remember that in African oral traditions and written documentation, there was heavy, heavy, heavy use of figurative language. This is something that we all are going to have to wrap our heads around and understand that what we call figurative language today and those being metaphors, allegories, symbolisms, um, hyperboles, you know, you name it. It's a whole bunch of different categories of figurative language. This was something that all Africans do all day, every day, especially in ancient times, and they still do it to this very day. In traditional societies, they use, they rely on it heavily. It's a way to uh, document information, and to us, it's a specialty. But but to the Africans in that that time, it was the norm. So, you know, if I say so, Kemet would be an idiom, a cultural idiom or a metaphor to de to designate a fertile area that's sustainable for a population of people, and also, the word Kemet was not used as the national name of the country until the 11th dynasty. Okay, Kemet was not always the name. Now, the word Kemet existed for, uh, you know, for uh, forever, <laughs> but, uh, so to speak, but not as a name uh, for the name of the country. That's right. What, it wasn't until the 11th dynasty that the word Kemet was used as a name for the country. Prior to that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna say a little note. It was uh, men. I think up under the administration of uh, Mentu Hotep the third. I think it was, if I'm, I'm correct, during mm -hmm. the Middle Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, Kemet was known simply as Tawi, which is the the two lands, or Sema Tawi, the the two lands that have been united, or Kenu, and the word Kenu simply means the residents. But it comes from a word that means the interior, the, the interior part. So the word kenu means interior, or you know, i.e., the residence, and that was the name. So prior to prior, so after that, it became known as Kemet. And then you have other words. You have Ta Meri, you have Ta uh, Seti. Like I just said, you have Ta Mehu, you have Ta Shemau, um, and so on. So we have to keep all of the, all of those things in mind. Now. Um, uh, for further reading, though, um, and I don't have it spelled out on a slide to show, but um, for further reading into the toponyms of Kemet, definitely look for a book. It is called. It's written by um, a person named. Um, his name is on the tip of my tongue. Wait a minute. Give me a second. I'll pronounce his name. Uh, correct. I don't, I'm probably not going to pronounce it, but its name is um, Ogden Gole, and it's O G D E N G O E L E T. Ogden Golet or Ogden Gole, and he wrote a, he wrote a um, an article actually inside of a journal, and it's called Kemet and other Egyptian terms for their land, and he does an excellent job at showing primary uh, sources for the first time usage of these different words and how they're used um, in opposition or in contradistinction between each other. All right, so definitely seek that out and um, read up on that. What, what did you What did you just say, uh, uh, Sin? What, what, what was the guy's name? Because uh, that might be the same guy I looked at the old, the uh, Golet guy, Ogde Golet. Is that what you just said? Yeah, Ogden oh. Golet. I text uh text it the I text the essays uh to them in the uh chat where they can go look it up. Okay, yeah, appreciate that. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again and we're gonna we're gonna uh just go ahead and quickly go over um the adjectives. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Black land. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, so we're leaving off of uh, that topic. So hopefully hopefully everyone understands. So so basically the bottom line is that Kemet does not is not referring to the color of anybody's skin, just like Desharet is not referring to anybody's skin color as being red, just like Abu is not referring to anybody looking like elephants, just like Inu, which is Heliopolis, is not talking about anybody looking like a column of, of, of a pillar or a column, and so on and so forth. 
All right, so we have to just keep all that in mind. So now we're gonna move on to adjectives, and this is uh, this will be real brief, but um, I, I I get this question a lot, so I figured we address it uh, tonight, and we'll have it on on record on the video in the archive. So adjectives, adjectives are words that modify, i.e., describes a noun or a pronoun. In Rodney Kemet, and again, the word Rodney Kemet is the indigenous name for the language. Okay, so we don't suggest using the word Egyptian. So in Rodney Kemet. There are two types of adjectives, qualifying adjectives and what they refer to as NISBY adjectives. So a qualifying adjective is an adjective that ascribes to its noun the value of an attribute or quality of that noun. So in other words, qualifying adjectives is, is what, we're, what we're used to. All right. Oh. A qualifying adjective is what we're used to. You know, uh, like for example, if I, if I want to describe uh, like I said, hair. Somebody has green hair. You know, the word green is a qualifying adjective. All right. Now, NISBY adjective adjectives are formed from a noun or a preposition, and it's done so by adding the suffix of a Y in the masculine singular. Their meaning indicates a relationship with the term from which they are derived. So, in other words, it would be a uh, the the one or the thing, the one of or the thing of or the one from or the thing from, or another example is the one who is or that which is, and I'm gonna give this, I'm gonna give some examples to make it clear. So, but remember, qualifying adjectives are pretty much the adjective that adjective that we're accustomed to that we're used to. Nisby adjectives are adjectives, but they're formed from nouns or prepositions. All right. So here are here are examples of those types of adjectives. So over here we have a qualifying adjective, and this is a very common one that a lot of people will uh, either recognize in the session of nature or just know from the word nefer or nefir. People pronounce it differently. Nefer or nefir, and it means beautiful. So this is a, a you know a typical adjective that we're used to. So if I say you know that was a, that's a beautiful dress, you would use the word nefir, uh, beautiful. Like I'm saying beautiful dress in English. Okay, so now here are uh, nisbis, but this 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 example is showing nisbi from a noun, and this example is showing nisbi from a preposition. So the noun. So let's take the noun um, aminet, which means west. So this is a, a cardinal point, a location, the west. Uh, some people say amint, or some people say aminet. Uh, no matter how you pronounce it, we're still talking about the west. Now. So this is the noun. Now the nisbi of this noun would be a minty. So you have this y, this y here on the end, which is which is um, you see these diagonal strokes here inside the glyphs. This would be a minty. So remember, a nisbi indicates a relationship with the term from which they are derived. So it carries the 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 notion of the the one from or the thing from or the one of or the thing of etc. So if I want to designate a, a person from the West or of the West then I will call him a Westerner. You know like you're a Westerner, like you're a Southerner, like I'm, I'm in Georgia so I'm a Southerner. So you would take the noun West and turn it into a, an adjective and describe me as a Westerner. So it would be a minty one who is of the West or one from the West, etc. All right, so that's the noun. Now, on a preposition, this is a very common preposition. You see owls everywhere. Um, the owl represents the preposition m when it's transliterated, but it means in, to be in, you know, as a preposition. Now, to make this into, turn this into an adjective, it will become m. Translated as I am, and this is the typical way that it's shown. And a lot of times it's shortened to just the reed leaf and this cross. And a lot of people will mistake this as the Christian cross. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about it, but it's actually a biliteral for M. But anyway, to change this preposition, M, for N, to a Nisby, you would say Emmy. So that's a, that's a typo right there. So excuse me, I apologize for that. It's supposed to be a Y 
right here after that. So it would be emi, which means who is in. Okay? So it goes from m to emi, who is in. So these are adjectives. So this is an adjective from a preposition, adjective from a noun, and this is your typical um, adjective. Now, how are they used? Okay, so here's the use of adjectives. So they're used either in two ways, as an attributive adjective or as a predicative or predicative <laughs> adjective. All right, and this is the difference. And attributive adjectives or attributed adjectives are placed after the noun to which they modify and they agree with the noun in gender and number. Now I'm going to say this, in English when I said earlier like if I say um, green hair, everyone should know that green is the adjective. Now in that phrase green hair, green is an attributive adjective but in English our attributive adjectives go before the noun okay in Rodney Kimmett they go after the noun so that's why it says attributive adjectives are placed after the noun to which they modify so attributive adjectives act just like the adjectives in Spanish and French so in Spanish if I were to say white house I would I wouldn't say blanca casa I would say casa blanca casa meaning house blanca meaning uh, white. Okay, so Rodney Kimmett is the same way in terms of attributive adjectives. So here are some examples. So we have Ked Kim. And here's that word for black, Kim. So we have Ked Kim. Ked means a pot. So we have, so literally we have pot black. But in English we would say black pot. So Ked Kim is black pot. We have another one, Majat Desheret, and it means majat means scroll or book, and desheret is red. So we have majat desheret, which would be red scroll. All right. Now, because this word is feminine, majat, this adjective desher takes on a feminine marker and becomes desheret to match. So this is why it says that it agrees with the noun in gender and in number. So majat desheret will be the red scroll. All right. So that's attributive. Now, predicative or predicative adjectives, they're placed at the beginning of the clause, and they are masculine. Okay. So I'm using the same examples but showing uh, predicative, and this simply means that the adjective is in the predicate. And if, and if and if we think back to our um you know high school lessons or grade school lessons about uh, English grammar, uh, all sentences have a subject and a predicate. You know, the, the subject is, is the, the actor or whatever, and then the predicate is, is, includes the verb and whether prepositional phrases and things like that. So uh, a predicative adjective is simply an adjective that's in the predicate. So these are very, very simple examples. I'm, I'm just reversing these. So instead of saying, Ked Kim, which will be the black pot. Now I'm saying Kim Ked, which now I'm saying the pot is black. Is black being the predicate and black being the adjective within the predicate. Therefore, it's called predicative adjectives or predicative adjectives. So, Ked, uh, so Kim Ked is the pot is black. So you can see how it's different than this one. So this has no predicate. This is this is a phrase. This is incomplete. If I just say Ked Kim, I'm just saying the black pot. But now you're gonna be like, well, what about it? What what? You know, it's it's missing. But now I'm saying a whole clause here. The pot is black. And I can put a period there, and that's a that's a sentence. Uh the pot is black. End of story. Um so it's 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 complete. So the the adjective is in the predicate. So here's the second one, uh, desher majat. Now notice that it's not desheret anymore, and this is why it says they are in the masculine singular. So desher majat, the scroll is red. There's a difference between saying the red scroll. Now I'm saying the scroll is red. So the adjective is in the predicate.
So Desher Majat. Okay? And that's pretty much it. Yeah. Hopefully that's understood. I mean, that's it's pretty straightforward. But I, I, I want to do that because um, a lot of people have been asking about about that adjectives um, and also with the with the um, word for Kemet, the meaning of Kemet. So I like I said, I can't see the screen or anything, but if, if there are any questions from the YouTube chat or if anybody wants to chime in, by all means, go for it. Yes, you're still being uh, just digesting, but that was good. It's pretty straightforward, you know. All right. <laughs> like I said, I've, uh, when my screen is not showing, I feel like I'm talking to myself, so I have to, I have to check. And if I ask a question and nobody says anything, I'm like, wow. So, you know. Um, but hopefully that's understood about, about the adjectives. But any, any questions from the, from the panel? Any, any comments, questions from, from any, any of you all? No? Okay. Well, I mean, may, maybe it was, it was too straightforward. <laughs> But hopefully people will wrap their mind around the adjective. It's, it is straightforward. Um, and these are things that occur in English as well. It's just, it's just that, you know, we take it for granted because, you know, we don't, we've been in school, we're out of school, we don't, we don't, we use it, but we don't realize what we're using and what we're doing. You know, so um, hopefully everyone might wrap their mind around it. So, okay, so let's review real quick. So about the, about Kemet. And it being, um, you know, the the designation for skin color, you know, like I said, the logic would not make sense, okay? When you when you step outside of Kemet and you apply the same logic to all the other place names, it just doesn't make sense, all right? And it's too much information and too much um, literature itself that would dictate otherwise. That it's not talking about the skin color of the people. In fact, the uh, remage, the general depiction. When they're de when it's being depicted on the various different walls, tombs, temples, and things like that, it's not even um, the color itself black. It's more of a, a red brown hue. Okay, so and these colors are are symbolic. You know, we have women with yellow, the the average person with this dark brown or red hue. Um, in the uh, funerary scenes, you have people that are white, you know, that are pale. Um, the the mourners, the professional mourners, like you can see this inside of the uh, papyrus of Ani, the Per and Heru of Ani, Per and Heru of um, Hunefer. Uh, you can see in the in the funerary procession, you'll see this group of women in there where you can see through their clothes, like you can see this uh, sheer clothing that they're wearing. They look like they're pulling their hair. Or or um, touching their hair with the hand hands in the air and they're pale, their skin is pale, all right. That that uh white ghost like, you know. So these things have meaning. They're symbol. They're not take to be taken literally. And then as far as the question about um, Usir being you know Lord of the Perfect Black, we have to remember Usir. These diff various different Neturu are not sentient real human beings in the first place. There's no human being. With an ibis head, there's no human being with a falcon head. There's no human being with, um, you know, a beetle's head and things like that. These are all used in a, a figurative way, and this is something that we all are going to have to wrap our minds around and understand, and pierce through to get to the realities behind it. And and the first step along that those lines is to learn the language. This is why. I've teach the language. This is why I focus on the language. Is because this is the the opening of the way for that, you know. And uh, for example, I'll give you another example. There's a phrase, um, like for example, if you look up the word for happy or joy inside of Rodney Kimmett, you can look up in any dictionary, you'll see that the word is awud ib, which is two words. Awud ib. The word awud means to stretch or to lengthen something. And then ib is the heart. So if you take that phrase literally, then everyone will be dead who is happy because your heart would get stretched. And if your heart stretched, you would die. So it is, it's used as an idiom. It's a figurative phrase for the lengthening of the heart, which is a, a idiom for happiness, for joy. 
for laughing. You know, and you know, we, we can go through and, and pick out a whole bunch of different phrases like just like that. So we just have to keep these things in mind. All right. So is that like saying uh the phrase you always say, uh when you know better, you do better? I mean, uh they used to say that back in the day. <clears throat> Kemet means black people and but as we advance and what our ancestors want us to do is refine and define and get more detail about the science and we're supposed to progress it and we're supposed to hone in on and say well well let's look at this and that's what we're doing tonight say hey let's you know we, we, we looked at it you know and, and determined that you know there's, there's very other ways to go with this it's not black people you know right exactly and you know like like I said that this is why I wanted to make clear that you know um, our elder scholars uh, Dr. Theophilo Benga is, is definitely still with us. Uh, Sheikh, Dr. Sheikh Antajiyab is is not. Um, but we have to remember the climate, and even uh, Dr. Ben. You know, um, if you listen to his lectures and you, and you and you read the the material in the books, we have to realize that the 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 academic climate that these scholars were in. You know, and we're still in that climate. It's just that information is abundant now that that they have to change they have to change the uh they have to shift things a little bit no no longer um no longer is it a question of is Egypt in Africa anymore you know forty years ago that was a that was you know a question like you know you walk around and think that hey Egypt is not in Africa they say it's in the Middle East. You know, and then they put the Middle East outside of Africa. The Middle East is a region. And they put Kemet outside of that. I mean, in that, outside of Africa. But I, I, I don't understand that, though. I mean, if you look at a map, you will see exactly where or uh, where Kemet is at. So I don't understand how they got away with that for so long, saying that Egypt or Kemet is outside of um outside of Africa. You know, the same way with the Middle East. When you talk about all those other Middle Eastern countries, they say that that's not a part of Africa. But when you look on the map, I mean, you can't you can't help but to see it, you know, you can't help to see it on there. And then when you talk about the Middle East, it wasn't no you, Middle East was coined in 1905. <laughs> so, I mean... I, I, think, I agree with you, Kofi. Uh, so, spots right here, though. The propaganda so cold with it, they got it on TV, got it in school, Egypt, 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 Middle East, Middle East, Middle East. So to the person that's not in search or trying to research, that stuff will drum in your head, like hearing a bad song a thousand times, and then you humming the song. You know what, and I, I was going to say this too. You know, see, it, it's really clear to us, right, to, to anybody who's been who pays attention, it's, it's clear. But you have to remember that even to this very day, there's people that still walk around thinking Christopher Columbus discovered America when when there were people, I mean, as if to say that there were no people already here. You know what I'm saying? So so it's 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 the propaganda, it's the repetition, and it's it's whatever you grow up being taught. You know what I'm saying? So Kemet not being uh in Africa is, you know, a tool of propaganda. Um Especially in that climate, you have to remember. Okay, check this out. Egypt, in in the eyes of of early Egyptology, the reason why Egyptology even came about in the first place, one of the reasons why, is because uh, you know Egyptology means the study of Egypt. So why the study of Egypt? Because Egypt, there's well, you know, the the very first wave of of the attraction to Egypt was for its wealth. It was it was to rob the graves. It was to it was to find all the treasures of Egypt, the gold in the tombs and things like that. So we know the history, but then it came, became a scientific study because Egypt had so much to offer. You know, in terms of the information, the the math, the sciences, the art, the um the uh, architecture, everything. You know, everything we can name. Um, the sciences, the the astronomy, all of that good stuff. Um, so a scientific discipline was created to study it. But now you have to think about this: How are you going to study a a civilization as great as Egypt, and then and then enslave people 
who can I, who can rightfully identify with that civilization. So it has to be some political, social propaganda going on to separate black people, as people um, say, or African people from this great African nation. So they have to say, okay, the nation, the people that came in Egypt, you know, the Egyptians were um, migrants from West Asia or even Europe, Caspian Sea, uh, you know, Central Europe or whatever, you know, coming down and settling there. And, and that's the, the birth of civilization of Egypt. Or just take Egypt all the way out of Africa <laughs> and just say that it's in the Middle East and then put the Middle East, you know, when we say Middle East, we think of, uh, you know, Israel, Iraq, and Kuwait, and Turkey, and things like that. Um, so that, so that you know, this proper is is part of all the propaganda and everything. But today, that's changed. So now, so now the propaganda has to change. It switches up. So now, what? Now the thing is, is they do it a lot different now. So what? What's going on right now? Is a campaign to discredit African scholars. So this is something that we don't need to be buying into. We have African scholars that are explaining African phenomena from an African paradigm, an African worldview, and an African perspective. And and so in order to combat that on their end, they have to broadly discredit. So they will call African scholars fringe scholars or scholars who are Afrocentric or scholars who just want to romanticize things and paint everything black and, and this and that. And there are some people that are doing that but not the African scholars that we need to be paying attention to. So that's why I say by broad strokes. So, so they try to just wipe all everybody away, you know, uh, even check out the GI, you know, Dr. Uh, Theophilo Binga, um, Muba Binge uh, Belolo, uh, Alan Anselin. You have, um, man, you have a whole bunch of, of African scholars that are, that are versed in their universities because they have degrees, and they are initiates of African um, initiation systems, and they speak multiple languages. They speak their own uh, mother language. They speak, uh, and then they speak the uh, colonial or colonizing language of French or whatever the case is, as well. So there's really no excuse. But I'm just saying that's the that's the new thing. That's the new thing is is to try to to discredit these scholars. But like I said, it's it's a lot of propaganda that goes into that. It's just that when you know, you know. Know better, you do better. So hope hope everybody um, can can um, understand that. And like I said, if you have any questions, you know, join the Facebook group Sashu Mani Metal Nature, and um, and pick up the, pick up on a discussion because you know we always want to discuss these things. And like I said, these two issues that we talked about tonight came from questions and discussions already. So we can we can definitely further uh, the discussion about these things. So adjectives, remember remember there's there's uh, two types. You have qualifying and nisbi, and then you have two usage, which is uh, attributive and predicative or predicative, depending on how you want to pronounce that. All right, so it's pretty straightforward. Oh, but um, brother Antoine, I saw you 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 guys. You gonna share your screen? You has you got you just you find any pictures? Yeah, hotel family. Apologize for my uh, tardiness. I have some things going on tonight, but yeah, um, no, it, I'm not sure if uh, you talked about elephant time. Uh, I spoke about it earlier, so yeah, if you have pictures, that would be great. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen real quick. Um, we know that ele elephant time uh, does not mean the elephant people. <laughs> More or less elephant land, and um, the reason why you know received that uh, that name is my screen sharing yet. Let me know. Yeah. Um, okay. There we go. I locked it on you. All right. So and the reason why I received that received that uh, name was uh, due to the fact that the uh, rocks protruding out the water looks like uh, elephants. And so here goes a pic. Um, of that, where you can kind of see where it looks like they're elephants, and this is all throughout the the Nile. I guess like Ele Elephantine Island is almost like an island off in the middle of the Nile. But when you travel down the Nile, you'll you look over to the side and you see like these elephants, <laughs> but they're actually not elephants, but they are these rocks. 
and they look like they're in the shape of elephants, almost like they're uh, marching towards somewhere. And you can see like almost a trunk or almost like a um, the behind of the elephant. And that's that's a, a one picture I have. Also had a uh, this is not my picture. So this picture, but well, a picture that I took on my uh, recent trip. Uh, I'm gonna share real quick. Um, from my photos is right here, and here um, is where this um, Mr. Big T left. Uh, this is his nilometer where he would measure the Nile, but down here we can also see where, an elephant time where they had the uh, the rocks look like the elephant. So <clears throat> just goes back to understanding the whole purpose of the adjectives and also understanding the uh, determinatives within the language and um, how they relate to the water most of the time. So that's all I want to share. Okay, yeah, that's excellent right there. Can you go back to that that picture? Go, uh, I think go back to the previous one. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. See, that's uh right. That's um, they look like elephants. <laughs> oh wow! And 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 that's see. This further shows that you. We, oh, that's this, nice. This is why you can't do the uh. It looks like uh <laughs> test. Because somebody would think that those are real elephants, but I mean they look like elephants, but we know that they're not elephants. How about the other picture? You had another one. I think I'm trying to see if I can find it. There we go. That one. Yeah. See, that was, that was like a um a pack of elephants trying to get out of the water or mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, literally it looks like the ears. You can see the ears. You can see the uh look like the back of it. Um, the backside. Yeah, it looked like the tail or whatever. Right there, you can see like a trunk. So, so right. So, you know, it goes back to what I was saying when I showed um, Abu. Now, the word for elephant in the language is Abu. And that's also the word for elephantine. Now, they call it elephantine today, but in the in the language, it would be Abu. And uh, let me unlock it off you. Yeah, and, and it's the uh, city of elephants. But... It's not describing the people. These are these, you know, they're not the they're not the skin color of the people or whatsoever. So, you know, and and you know, like I said, we can go through a lot of different um, uh, city names. You, you got a whole lot of names. You even have Behudet. You have uh, Nekeb, where Nekibet is from. You have Waset. You have um, Uni. You have um, Geptiu, Nebet Inut. You have all these different. Uh, Nebit Inut, Inut would be um, Dendera. They call it Dendora or Dendera today. You have then you have the um, Ombos and you have Komombo. So you have a whole lot of uh, cities. And if you find out what these words mean, um, outside of it being a place name, then you know you, the logic will will you know show itself that that when you go back to the word Kemet and you go back and you go to the word Desheret, these are two words that are used. In opposition, basically, to each other. One is red, one is black, but it's not black people and it's not red people. It's talking about the fertility or the infertility of the land. So anyway, I hope everybody um, can understand that, you know, and realize. But but and also importantly, um, like the journal. Let me see. Uh, I'll share my screen again real quick. Yeah, make sure make sure you get this journal. This these, this journal is free. Uh, well, not the whole journal, but this particular article is. Um, and if you if you if you go to the um, matter of fact, we'll put it the link in the description. But like I said, this picture here is is the same journal, but it's not this volume that the, this text is from. This I'm just showing a picture where you can go to the website. It's academicjournals.org, and go to African Journal of History and Culture. All right, you can actually subscribe to it and everything. But remember that the uh, place names or toponyms, as they're known, they, you know, they're they're not created arbitrarily. They're they're well thought out. They incorporate descriptions of the environment, the land, whether it's you know some kind of special flowers that grow there in abundance or certain animals that that go that are or live there in abundance, or the terrain. Um, you know, all these factors play into 
place names. And we also have to remember that Africans, uh, not every community, but a lot of African communities um, orientate their landscape based on the human body parts. And Kemet was no different. So in Kemet, we have um, the reverse of what we deal with today. Like, for example, uh, I wish I had a picture readily available uh, to show. But if you can imagine, if you can imagine the continent of Africa uh, laying on your floor, let's just say that your whole living room floor is the continent of Africa, and you're standing on it. You're standing right on the continent of Africa in its normal orientation that we're so used to seeing, with with Europe being in front of you, you know, above, and then uh, South Africa being behind you or below. Okay, and you're standing on it. Now, imagine that the cardinal points, north, south, east, and west, imagine those being fixed, like they can't move, okay? Those are stationary. North, south, east, and west, those cardinal points are fixed, okay? So what you would do, imagine yourself just doing a 180 turn with your body, just doing about face, okay? So north, the cardinal point north is behind you now. The cardinal point south is in front of you. The cardinal point uh, west is is on your right hand side and the cardinal point east is now on your left. This is the orientation of the ancient Remich or the ancient Egyptians. Okay and how do we know this is because the words for the cardinal points like for example the word I had up here um, for the Nisbi. This particular word here Aminet or Amint it means west, but it, it's also the word for right, R-I-G-H-T, the right hand, the right side of something. So therefore, the west is on the right, which is what I just described. And the east, I don't have it on the screen, but the east is Iabit, and that's also a word for left, the left hand or the left side of something. So the east is on the left over here, and the west is on the right over here. So the cardinal points stay stuck, stay stationary. All right? And it, it, this is why when you when they make the analogy of the sun going across the sky and they liken the the traveling of the sun as the span of someone's lifetime, they say when you die, you're going to the west. That means you're you're completing your day and the day being synonymous in that context being synonymous with life. So when you complete your day, you're completing your life and you're actually setting like the sun sets and you go into the duat or the underworld. Now, we, we do that every day, but in terms of a lifetime, it happens in the end of your lifetime. So west, west, going west is also synonymous with dying, so to speak. And to get there, you have to ride in a boat and you moor the boat. Your boat docks. And then you travel in the underworld, the um, duat, to be to rise, you know, rise again, and so on and so forth. But, but still, imagine that you're on this on this map of Africa, and you're standing there. So you're on your right hand side is America. Like if you look into the right, America's over here. Now the way we have the maps now, it's not like that. It's the opposite. I have it up on my screen. Oh, you do? Okay, let me lock it on your screen. Uh, let me stop sharing mine. Okay, yeah, there you go. So this will be the orientation that the ancient remits would be used to. Okay, so yeah, Europe will be right there. South Africa would be, you know, all the way up top and so on and so forth. So America would be all the way over to the right, you know what I mean? Uh, and then India and, and, and Australia and 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 everything would be over here, over there to the left. So now, what you see on the screen there at the top, you see the word resi. And the word resi, it, 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 tra they, they translate it as south. But it's the actual word for head, for the head of something. And um, so imagine, imagine you now if you're standing on top of Africa in your living room, like, like the example I gave. Now imagine yourself laying down, like lay down on your, on your stomach um, on the map. Just, you know, imagine yourself doing that. So your head, your head would be right there where Resi is. 
and then your feet would be down there where we see the word for north or mehut and the word mehut means to submerge to be below and it also means the end the end of something it's, it's the end of something and our feet is the end of our body our head is the to start or the top and then our feet is the is the the part of our body is below so your feet would be there your your right hand would be over there where I'm in I'm in tet and then you had your left hand would be over there where um Iabit, which would be east okay so these are actual words in the language so this this lets us know this this uh confirms the orientation so this is dealing with uh the comedic worldview or comedic worldview or the orientation of the people of the Nile Valley and I, that goes back to what we were just saying. I put it in the box. Uh, Kimnu, you know, it was called Kimnu before it was called Kimet or Tamiri, and uh, Timnu uh, <clears throat> means uh, resident or interior, which means the body. So he just explained to you the different body parts that they alluded to uh, in Kimet. You know, mm -hmm. west being the right, east being the left, rest at the top, or the south being the head, the north is being the foot. Exactly, exactly. So you know, we 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 can confirm it and cross reference. You know, these um, the all these things. So you know, we have to keep that in mind. So I was I was saying that to say that when we're talking about these place names, the formal name of place names is called toponyms. So these toponyms or place names are based on geography. Oh, real quick, you said when you say toponym, I don't know if you talked about it or not, but it makes me think of the word topography. Well, we know that that a, a topography map is a map that shows the actual landform, so that's related to toponym. Yeah, yep. Uh, topography, uh, toponymy, and uh, toponyms. You know, they all deal with places and and geography and terrain and things like that. Yeah. So, um, and even when we say upper Kemet and lower Kemet. Our our English use of those those phrases is based on the the geography or the or the terrain because when we say Upper Kemet, Upper Kemet on our maps is really south, but when we say Upper, we're using the word Upper in terms of elevation, because the further the further south you go on our maps or the further upstream you go inside of uh, the Nile, if you go upstream, you're going in a higher elevation. And by the time you get down to lower Kemet, it's actually low elevation sea level because it, it dumps out into the Mediterranean Sea. So you're, so you're dealing with elevation. So when we say upper Kemet, it's, it's high. When we say lower Kemet, it's low. It's literally low. It's, it's at sea level. So you got sea level versus mountains. You know, the further down the Nile, by the Nile, you know, going into the white and then breaking away to the blue, you got... Um, you know the the beginning of both of those branches. I believe one is in um, uh, Lake Victoria, I believe, or in uh, Tanzania, Kenya. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. And then the other one is is um, is somewhere else, but they're very they're high in the mountains. This is where the water originates from. It comes from these um, melting um, snow, ice, and things like that. You know, so you're dealing with elevation not not direction not upper as in the direction up you know so yeah we all have to keep all all this in mind well you know i hope 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 everybody learned something and uh or if you didn't learn if you already knew this then it's good to discuss it and just share it just share the information and you got any questions join the facebook group and um now if you want to learn more about adjectives and and more, more details about the language if you um, are a first-time novice or beginner with the language, uh, there is a new class group forming that's going to be meeting on Sundays, um, hopefully in Sundays, Sunday evenings, and um, and it's a for a beginner's study course. All right, so if you're fresh, if you're a beginner, or even if you um, are familiar with the language but you just want a, a refresher, you know, if you just want to kind of uh, get a refresher, then you know. Um, uh, join in, register for the class. It's going to start soon. As soon as I can um, get enough people to <laughs> coordinate, you know, availability on Sunday, I want to start a Sunday group. All right, and then soon in in the fall, which is coming up real fast uh, on us, uh, we will be starting 
an intermediate study in the grammar. Okay, and in the grammar, we'll go into a lot of details about where we'll, you know, what I briefly discuss about adjectives, about prepositions, about clauses, nonverbal uh, clauses, verbal clauses, the, the syntax, the morphology, which is, you know, dealing with all the grammar, the verbal system, um, all of those things. You know, we're going to take it back to high school, you know, but um, it's important. Rodney Kemet, middle Rodney Kemet, all right, language of Kemet. And it's going to be based on the grammar of classical Egyptian, as they call it, or Middle Egyptian. All right, but we'll go into uh, a lot more details, you know, than than we can have on these hangouts. But that's coming up. So that's in the future. That's that's in the works. All right. But um, was there any other questions? Anybody anybody in the uh, chat chiming in? But I, yeah, let me say ho ho tap to 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 everybody in the chat. Yeah, I see we have Quint uh, Quintessia, brother Sean. Uh, Monica, um, let's see who else do we have going on. Let me scroll up here. We got Brother Strife, Triple Seven, Lisa. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing roll call. Brother, Brother Christopher Withers. You know, I'm I'm from D.C. You know, in D.C. they have roll calls literally. You know, at the at the parties and in the clubs. You know, they actually shout out where where you from. And everybody would shout out where they from in DC, you know, northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. You know, I don't know if I got any DMV people out uh, watching, but you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, brother Kalik, I'm just scrolling up, looking for any any questions, comments. Yeah, if if I missed a question, uh, type it type it in again because I I can only scroll but so far. So. Um, Oh, and we have Christopher Walker, Hotep, Tip. Yeah, where y'all from? You know, uh, Orange Mound, Memphis. All right, we got Tennessee in the house. All right. Memphis. What part of Memphis he from? From the north, north? Tennessee, Orange Mound. Orange Mound, Memphis, Tennessee. Orange. Okay, Orange Mound. Okay. Yep. Hey, I, I, I hope there's nobody from planet Africa, you know. <laughs> or, President. <laughs> planet Africa. Wow. I mean, wow. I mean, I heard, I, man, that's, you know, I don't know if that's serious or not. I, you know, I, I think people are joking. I, I definitely don't. I get them. I, don't, I doubt if people are really serious about that. Africa is another planet. Mm-mm. <laughs> What are you trying to say? That was Photoshop? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I refuse to believe that anyone actually thinks that Africa is a separate planet. I, I just I just won't accept that right now. Nah, I had to. Mm -mm. That would be too much for me right there. But, um, yeah, we got Houston in the house, South Carolina in the house. All right. Yeah. So, anyway, we've been here for two hours. You know, we started on time. We're gonna to try to start on time every time. And yeah, yeah. If you have, if you have a recommendation, like like a DJ, you know, we we take requests on different things you want to talk about or us to cover. And like I said, if we know, we'll share. If we don't know, we simply say we don't know. Or or you give us time, we'll look into it. You know, because we're all learning. Uh, and matter of fact, on that note, I'm gonna tell you, the the Egyptian culture or the Nekemet culture. And the uh, Nikemet language, Rani Kemet, is is so vast that we have a lot to learn. We still have a whole lot to learn, a whole lot to learn. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you an example. This is this is the kind of question that we need to investigate. This is one, a little quick sample. Um, if anybody's already familiar with the language, we have what's called phonetic complements. Okay, and these are monoliteral glyphs that complement biliterals or triliterals. So like for example in the word nefer or nefir, um, you have this triliteral glyph and it stands for three consonants N, F, R. And then you have the phonetic complements of an F and an R which will be the um, horn viper and the open mouth. And we always see that. Nefer, just like that. Those three signs. 
Now we don't pronounce it nefer fur. We don't you know we don't repeat the F and the R. We just say nefer because the other two signs complement. They just simply complement the thing, the um the first sign. So now phonetic complements seem to only make sense if a sign can have more than one value. So like for example, if this nefer sign could it possibly also be I'm just gonna make up something. Let's just say it could be uh, a n k. Let's say that sign could also stand for those three consonants a and k. So that means it could stand for a and k, or it could stand for n f r. So co phonetic complements would would make sense in that sense because now it lets us know which of those two options we we supposed to um, go with. If it's if it has the horn viper over mouth, then we know okay it's nefer. If it if it had the um, the water ripple and the basket with a handle, then we know it's it should be uh, A and K. You you know what I'm saying? So, but so that only makes sense for signs that can have those multiple uh, options. But the word nefer doesn't. That sign is NFR all day every day. So, the phonetic complements, you know, there's a question mark. Why? Why the need for it? Not why the need for it in that instance. And I'll give you an instance where it is truly it truly is needed, a real instance, for the word ab or the word mer, where you have the chisel. The chisel is a bilateral sign that could represent the two consonants mr in the word mer, or it could represent ab in the word ab. So it makes sense to have the phonetic complements there so it could let us know. And that's an actual uh, real example. But in the other signs, you know, it doesn't. So that's a question. That's that's something that we have to uh, make sense of and everything, you know. And it and it, it would take some investigating to do, to figure that out. I mean, does that make sense? That that you know the logic behind the question. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, yeah. Right. So I mean, it's 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 it's, it's a lot. That was that's just a quick. I think uh, a similar question would relate to determinatives, as far as the the role they play. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, it, so there's a lot. There's still a lot to learn. Still a lot to investigate. But we do know a lot about the language. Um, but there's a whole lot more to learn. So, you know, we got to be flexible. And and I and I say that because you know either we know it or we don't. Either we you know when we don't know something we investigate, do our best to investigate, um, and find out. And we can all walk that walk together. You know. Yeah, possibly if we uh may be able to to do that activity again, I think um, that was nice because we had a lot of uh, audience participation. Yeah, we, doing. well, we need to. Okay, we could find some pictures to uh, continue to do that. Yeah, that was that was definitely fun. I think that um, people enjoyed that, and it's good to see other people catching on and 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 um and getting the answers correct. Um, brother Shesmu, I don't know if Shesmu is watching us now. <laughs> Brother Shazmu was was listing all the uh, <laughs> all the deities. We show a deity, and Shazmu's going down the list: uh, Atum, Pata, Sekhmet, uh, Heru, uh, Jehudi. <laughs> so um, now nah, it was fun, but um, hopefully we'll be able to do that again. We find some more pictures. So I need to, guess we need to start looking for some more pictures. But uh, anybody have any closing remarks? Um, I don't really see any any questions. Hopefully, that all that stuff is straightforward. Um, yeah, that was really good. And um, hopefully, um, from now on, when anybody sees people posting all that stuff about <laughs> Kemet means black people, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully you get the right information to actually help a brother or a sister out, <laughs> you know, in um, getting the definitions correctly. But that was really good. Um, was good and it was good um, including the parts because I think most people we, when we read about that we always forget um, to always include that um, the African perspective into it how, how do Africans um, name locations and things like that so and this is this is very important and that is never included because we're trying to understand um, something without actually getting into <laughs> the culture that um, <laughs> was doing that so that was very important that we understand the way that um, um, Africans name locations and, 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 and stuff like that. That was really good. This is the link www 
dot mdw hyphen ntr dot com and the uh, in the uh, beginner's introduction to Metaneture, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic system is also available um, it's available in both hardback and softback soft cover all right and that book is a tool it's a complimentary tool for the class so you will need to have it for the class all right and then the flashcards as well a lot of people are sleeping on the flashcards you know, um, but I recommend you get the flashcards because it'll definitely speed up the process of you learning the monoliterals, and it, it serves you know the purpose of uh, similar to what we have today as as alphabet. All right, these are all the mon monoliteral signs that you have to memorize. There's no way, no way of getting around that. You have to memorize the monoliterals at the very least, and the flashcards uh, assist you in that. Or you can make your own. You know. So I don't want to make it sound like you have to get uh, these, but make your own or get these. These are made. They're convenient. They have the glyph on one side and information on the other side. All right. And it's a good way to kind of get other people interested, too, because you can tell somebody to, to quiz you, test you, even though you can test yourself. But if you get somebody to test you, then by them testing you, they're learning at the same time, whether they, whether they realize it or not, because they have to look at the <laughs> information and they're flipping it over, too. So that's a good way to kind of get people interested. Uh, but yeah, sign up for the class on the website if you're interested, or and, and tell tell other people if you know somebody else who's interested, you know. And we and we meet two hours once a week for twelve weeks, so it's twelve weeks long, two hours once a week. All right. So with that, I will pass the mic, and anybody else having last comments or Sonia Tonica, you can um, close us out. All right. Well, um, Dua for the presentation. That was really, really good. And um, thank you for everybody that tuned in and everybody that's going to be tuning in um, later on in the archives. But, um, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I'll say get an affair and um, shaman whatever. <laughs>